right, so let's get into it. Okay, and again, we're just going to ask a few questions, and then Professor Davis will walk around and take your questions. So you'll stand up or sit. It's, it's very informal, and share your question. Okay. All right. So the first one I have is let's just get into it. Voter suppression. Um, how often do you all think that has happened in the history of voting, and do you anticipate that happening with this election? Uh, voter suppression has been happening ever since we had the right to vote, before we had the right to vote. It started with having to count jelly beans in a jar. It started with having to count how many pieces or grains of rice were in a jar. We think that we have come so far from those days and we haven't. So what voter suppression looks like now is you have to bring voter ID. That is a form of voter uh, suppression. When felons can't vote, that is a, a form of voter suppression. Lack of access to being able to vote. Why is there not a voting opportunity on this campus? Today when I went to ask for uh, absentee ballots, I said, hey, can I get some absentee ballots? I'm going to a college, I'm speaking. They said, no, no, you gotta, they got to come pick up their own. And I said, well, why? Well, because we need to make sure that you are really going to give that voting, at that absentee ballot. These are forms of voter suppression. When we look at felons who can't vote, uh, Ms. Blakeney and I, we were talking about this right before the session. So they, they can vote, right? So they said, well, you can't vote right now, but you can vote. You'll be able to vote again once you pay your restitution and once you are no longer on papers and once you are finished with probation. Well, what? happens when people are on probation they're on probation for 10 years 15 years the restitution may be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so that is a form of voter suppression uh, but that does not mean that we still stay home so if they tell you bring ID you know what bring your ID don't go without ID now can you vote with I without ID you can but there's so many extra things you have to do but please make sure we have to make sure this and I know I'm going to stay in a nonpartisan space. But we have to make sure we go so big they can't rig this election. That's what we have to show up in big numbers. So when you go vote, take your ID. If you have voting locations right close by, come see me, because I'm usually at one of these polling locations. But that's what voter suppression is. Awesome. Anybody else want to answer? Uh, yeah, I just recently got back from Memphis, where the first International Civil Rights Museum is. It's where Martin Luther King was assassinated. And one of the exhibits in Memphis uh, spoke directly to voter suppression, and it showed examples of the literacy tests that were used specifically to keep black people from voting. Um, and I hear, I get so frustrated when I hear black people say, my vote doesn't matter. Well, if your vote didn't matter, why are they fighting so hard to keep you from doing it? And every time you make a decision to not vote, you're upholding, you're doing exactly what they want you to do. Um, and so when you think about voter suppression, when you talk about felons not being able to vote, well, the highest rates of incarceration are black and brown people. And so it's not accidental, and we keep talking about, oh, the system, the system, but we have an opportunity through voting to make some changes within that system. Um, and so voter suppression, especially in the last elections, uh, has been a very real thing. And it, it is contributing to the ongoing oppression of our people. I love that. So yesterday we had a voting in class, and we put them through a suppression moment. So if you were mad yesterday, raise your hand. <laughs> a lot of y'all were mad. Lanessa was mad at me yesterday. I knew she was going to file a complaint on me. But <laughs> we took them through that exercise so they okay. could see what that was like. Ms. Blakeney. I, I just want to say, since you're on campus, po people will say that you can't vote because you were in college. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. You can vote. You can register here at Johnson C. Smith to vote in North Carolina. You may be from New York, South Carolina, Philadelphia. You can vote. So let no one tell you you can't vote because you are in college. Use your education, you can. Awesome. Um, as my fellow panelists have said, um, voter suppression is um, not only a legacy in the black community, but just a legacy in the country. Um, we're not far removed from um, women uh, gaining the right to vote. We're not far removed from us uh, as black people gaining the right to vote. Um, literacy tests um, are, they were real. Uh, I don't think anybody would have been able to pass a literacy test in this room because they didn't want you to pass. They were rigged specifically so that you didn't pass. Um, any trick that they can pull off, um, they made sure that you didn't pass. Uh, 
voter ID, having ID as a voter, that is a form of voter suppression. Um, so it's just important for us to go out, especially as young people, to go out and exercise our right to vote um, because it, they are fighting to take it from us. And it is also our responsibility to combat voter suppression by being informed. Uh, misinformation is a form of suppression, and it is a very powerful form of suppression in this day and age. Um, a lot of times when we talk about uh, our politics, a lot of us, uh, and sometimes myself included, start off with um, this TikTok I've seen or this tweet that I've seen. Um, and a lot of times they're not fact-checked, so make sure that you are looking at stuff that is fact-checked. I've heard a lot of people say, I'm a felon, I can't vote, in states where they can vote and they have the right to vote. I've heard a lot of people say, I can't vote because I'm a college student. And you can vote as a college student. Yes. You are technically a resident of whatever state that you are residing in. So please go and vote, or if not, uh, send in an absentee ballot. So, yeah. Thank you. Ms. Blakeney, we'll start with you with this next question. Can, <laughs> can you tell us how Johnson C. Smith has had a historical relationship with voting and politics? Or not? <laughs> Johnson C. Smith has always had a historical relationship with um, voting. Uh, I need to tell you that I'm so young that I've been out of school 52 years at Johnson C. Smith. So when I first came, oh, I was elated that I could vote. Um, did not know how to do it, but requested some information from the polit political science teacher and found out that we could go right down the street to the Beatty's Fold Road uh, Library and register to vote. And several, I won't call names because I don't want nobody to say, well, she didn't call my name. But several of the political officials uh, were graduates of Johnson C. Smith and still are graduates of Johnson C. Smith and kept us uh, politically informed. And we, we feel great here at Johnson C. Smith for more than one reason. Uh, you love sports, but you must love your life. And uh, voting is a part of your life. That's what has been given to you. And as he just said, as females, we're not that far removed from and yet having a chance to vote. And Johnson C. Smith takes pride in making sure that you have the opportunity to vote. Um, so specifically, um, something that is very near and dear to my heart, um, as a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, uh, Johnson C. Smith is a very important part of our history. Um, our national program of voteless people is a hopeless people was founded on Johnson C. Smith's campus in 1936. So um, that is one thing that goes to show that voting and um, politics is very important on this campus. Uh, we've had a historical legacy of uh, hosting very high pro profile um, civil rights leaders so, um, such as Martin Luther King, such as um, such as Malcolm X. So it is very it is very important to be uh, politically involved and to be politically informed uh, as a Smith student. If you would like to honor the legacy that we have here, uh, Smith was definitely uh, or historically has been a site for political activism. It's not talked about often. So I got my master's at North Carolina A and T, and they talk about the Greensboro Four and how they staged the sit-ins. What isn't talked about as often is that JCSU students also um, were heavy, heavily involved in the integration of downtown, or uptown Charlotte rather, with sit-ins and protests to stop uh, segregate or end segregation in Charlotte. Uh, not only that, the first time I voted was at JCSU as well as a student um, in the very first Obama election. And uh, when I stepped foot on campus, they were doing party buses to the polls. Uh, we had a debate watch party leading up to the elections. Like there was just a heavy 
uh, spirit of activism and political engagement on campus. Like we literally had JCSU shuttles that they turned into party buses, had DJs playing music and like hyping us up to the polls. Um, and so the the spirit of political engagement and involvement on this campus goes way back to segregation um, and has continued as far as I know, um, or was continued as far as I know, uh, at least in, in 2008. Awesome. Ms. Strayton, I'm going to start with you on this one. What is your viewpoint on youth who say, none of this is about me? Like, I, I, these issues, I, my, I'm on my mom's taxes, that one back there. Um, my mom pays my health insurance, that one back there. Like, so why does this matter? Well, you all knew it mattered when they were uh, threatening to take TikTok away about two years ago. <laughs> you all knew. Who, I, show, let me see by a show of hands. Do you all remember that when that came up? that they were going to, oh yeah, uh huh. <laughs> See, you knew to get active then. You knew the problem then because you all raised up so much and so quickly that it overwhelmed the government when they were going to take TikTok away. You all knew exactly what to do. You knew to call the government. You all were on TikTok yelling and fighting and screaming and don't take TikTok away. But it is the same thing with your rights. It is the exact same thing. So when you say, so you knew how to use the system for your benefit because when that happened, you all activated and as my generation, because I'm just now learning that I'm getting older, I just realized that I didn't know until I started hanging around young people. I'm like, oh, I'm not as cool as I thought I was. But what, I, what I'm learning though is that you all will get active. You all know what's going on. You all are not canvassing. You're not doing the things my generation did. So we're out knocking on doors and we're making phone calls and we're doing all of this. And I had a conversation with some collegiate students, one who goes here, and she said, no, we're not doing that. You all are canvassing differently. And I love that. You all are engaging each other differently. And I love that. You all are natives to technology, meaning that the day you were born, you knew how to use technology. We didn't do it. We had to slowly, you probably don't even know what Pac-Man is, but we had to slowly ease into it. We had to, I know, we had to slowly ease into it. But I want you all to continue that type of advocacy. You don't have to knock on the door with me. You don't have to make calls. But what I want you to do is get in those chat groups, those chat groups that you are in. And I'm going to show you something I just learned. How many of you are on Facebook? Raise your hand. These kids aren't on Facebook. <laughs> they're, not, they're not on Facebook. And we got a couple in here. But what I learned, I thought all you are on Facebook. Until the collegiate said, we're not on Facebook. We're on TikTok and Instagram. So where I think I'm reaching you with my message, because I'm like, oh, they're going to love this message on Facebook. You all don't even <laughs> see it. You all don't even see the message. So I now have to reframe, and I have to readjust. But you all know what's going on. So why does it matter? Because your vote are now in your your life your very life is on the line I'm going to tell you for me and I'm going to tell you what is very important for you many of you probably have student loans I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands but I left college with seventy thousand dollars in student loans in 2020 I was paying my student loans now not maybe not the first four years because I had just started working and didn't really realize it was that important but what ended up happening is 20 years later when I was still paying for my student loans my bill grew to one hundred seventy nine thousand dollars from seventy thousand to hundred and seventy nine thousand I was paying a thousand and twelve hundred dollars a month and so had I not been active in the process I would not have understood that I, my vote, my, my vote can make a difference. So today, I don't have student loans because they were forgiven by the government who I voted for. So this is why you have to get active because it impacts your life. I voted too and I'm still paying student loans. Oh, <laughs> I'll give you the tips and tricks. Thank, thank you. We'll talk later. They're going to have to we'll get talk. that back in blood. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kevin, I'm going to start with you because when I talk about you to people, and I've, this is one of my second moms down here. I told her, I've never met a young man like you. Like, when I taught Kevin a year ago, yes, there are some days I was like, Kevin, why don't you teach? Like, why am I here? This man is incredible, seriously. Um, his knowledge, and he's a public health major, but I just, uh, you know what I feel about that. But anyway, <laughs> so Kevin, tell me and tell, tell us, how did you get so involved in politics and how what can young people do to get there with you 
Um, so first of all, thank you for the that was that was <laughs> nice. Heart warm my heart a little bit. Um, but so I would I would call I would say I I just I have a love for learning. I'm not necessarily very political um, in the sense that I am political when it comes to voting and when it comes to who is going to um, who is going to be you know running our government and making decisions for us. Um, but I'm not. Um, I don't belong to any party. I'm very nonpartisan as a person. I think that um, everybody screws up just the same. <laughs> um, that's a very cynical way to think about it, but that's how I think about it. Everybody uh, messes up the same. So I, I take a pride in learning about um, history. I'm very involved in looking back, looking at um, leaders, um, from from years ago, and a lot of them, a lot of times they're our age. Uh, Fred Hampton was 21 when he passed away, and he um, pretty much pioneered uh, the free, like the free lunch program and like the free breakfast program as we know it. That's in schools. Um, so I take I take pride in learning about those who came before me, and with that, it propels me into looking into policy and looking into um, being informed in politics. Uh, I'm currently, um, and I like how you said that, uh, how you feel about me being a public health major, um, because I'm currently working with, um, in our own voices, the Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda, or the National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda. Um, and quickly, I just wanted to say that my opinions do not reflect the organizations. <laughs> um, but it is, it, it's although it's public health, I'm working in policy. It is very much so policy driven. Um, a lot of reproductive rights are on the table in this election. I implore you to go and look um, at the policies of those who are running um, as nonpartisanly as possible. I'll say that. Um, but it, it's important to to educate yourself and to take pride in knowing who runs what, knowing who is in charge of what, knowing um, the policy, because it it runs your everyday life. It's, it is important. Although it may feel that um, national government doesn't matter and, you know, my vote doesn't count and the electoral college will pick who they want anyways, it is important for us to go out and vote, not only nationally, but locally, um, because it is important. Um, a lot of stuff is preventable should we go and vote on it. And as soon as you turn 18, you need to be worried about going to make your voice matter. So let me just ask the audience really quickly. How many of you all think of the students, how many of you think that uh, the rights that are being argued against are just simply about abortion? How many of you think that that's really what it is? That's, that's the end of it at the end of the day. You think, okay, so you all know there's other things Right, so birth control, whether you need it, right, for medical things or whether you simply want it to protect yourself. Um, and there are other issues, right, with your body. So Kevin, tell us what you think, not so much as a man, right, but just as a scholar, as a learner and what you're doing. Um, why is this particular issue so important that everybody in here should, should go educate themselves on? Um, it's important because there, it starts with one particular group, right? So it always starts with one group. Any, any injustice always starts with one person, and it starts with other people saying, it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. And then it grows, and then it turns into your problem. So um, they have been policing black bodies since we have stepped on American soil, um, and it, it, it's important for us to to make sure that 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 it stops, um, they're trying to they're trying to you know ban abortions. They're trying to get rid of emergency contraception. They're trying to um, police birth control. Um, it, it, it's getting a little extreme. So it is it is um, it is our duty to make the correct decisions 
in terms of making sure that everybody has rights because it does not only affect the woman. Um, it, it takes two to tango. It takes two to make a child. Um, and, you know, it, you, you need to, everybody deserves to have rights. It is a fundamental human right. We should have bodily autonomy. Um, so I work hard not only to make sure that, you know, on this campus we have those resources, that we have emergency contraception and um, safe sex items, but if, like, if that right is infringed upon, then, number one, I won't be able to do my job that I love doing. I won't be able to make sure that the campus has whatever we need. But more importantly, the community and the campus won't have what they need regardless. They won't be able to go to CVS. Um, they won't be able to come to me and get a, you know, a free uh, plan B or whatever. Like, it's important that we all take this seriously and that we all vote. Um, we all vote with others in mind. If you don't have, like, if your issue isn't in the ballot, like if, if you're not vote, vote for other people's issues. Vote as a community. Be mindful of those that you see every day. Be mindful um, because it might not be your fight right now, but God forbid, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years, five years down the line, a year in advance, like you're gonna wish that you have, that you voted for somebody other than yourself. And don't just be one one issue voters. Um, I've heard a lot of that, uh, as you know, in our generation. Um, you know, a lot of people worried about the conflict overseas and worried about this or that. Um, try not to be a one uh, a one pot like one policy voter. Take it. Be take a holistic approach. Look at all of their policies and how everything that they want to do will affect your life, and take that into consideration before you make your your decision. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I love that point, uh, to not just vote on one policy and also with, like not voting on just people, but voting for policy. Um, every election I look at, who's most aligned with the things that, uh, with the issues that are on the table, with the, who's most aligned with my, my views. Um, and so even when it comes to reproductive rights, while personally I may have certain opinions around uh, abortions or et cetera. I, I also know that policies around abortion don't have exceptions. The majority of the policies that are banning abortions make zero exceptions for rape or incest, um, which that is when you talk about, oh, this isn't my issue. I may be pro, you can be pro-life, that's fine. Um, you also can't control if you're sexually assaulted, right? And so abortion bans don't leave room to discern, well, were well, you sexually assaulted? Um, the majority of the, the women presenting individuals I see in the room are women of color. On the, uh, in the delivery room, the highest mortality rates are for black women. And so while it's like, oh, this may not be my issue or et cetera, it doesn't just impact uh, you now. It may not impact you now, but it has consequences long term that could impact you later, um, or it could impact someone you know. Uh, IVF. People have made IVF for whatever reason a, a uh, homosexual thing, when statistically over 60% uh, of IVF treatments are done for heterosexual couples. So it's not just for homosexual couples who want to conceive. There are heteros heterosexual couples who have issues with conception. Um, I personally have close friends who have gone through IVF because they struggled to conceive in heterosexual relationships. And so a lot of the social media narratives will have you um, thinking, oh, this is a, a gay issue or this is a, an abortion issue when they put so much into these bills and policies and they hone in on one piece to get you to think one thing. Um, so you really have to be informed on everything that's included when we talk about reproductive rights, access to uh, general care for reproduction um, and reproductive issues. It's not just a one, one issue thing. I just want to share this, especially for um, the biological gentleman in the room, and I'll tell you why I said that. Uh, because there is, so as we talk about reproductive justice, right, and we talk about, oh, is that, you know, sometimes men like to tune out, you know, tune out on that conversation. You know, I can't get pregnant. You like to kind of tune out, but I want to tell you how it's going to impact you. So um, there is a bill, this is nonpartisan, it's the truth, look it up on congress.gov. There is a bill 
the Unborn Child Support Act. So has anybody heard of the Unborn Child Support Act bill? What this means is on that night of fun, if you mess up and the woman becomes pregnant, you will start paying child support at that night. You won't pay child support. Come on, ladies. Come on, ladies. You will not pay child. You will pay child support at nine months, but they will determine that you are the father while she is carrying the baby. Child support starts then. And that is, a, that is something that the Republicans are pushing. I actually like that because you, the expenses don't come after nine months when the baby is born. The expenses start on that first time they got to go to the doctor. The expense start at the pregnancy test. So this is what's happening right now. So when you think that, so now we have on one side reproductive justice, uh, you know, banning abortions and all of that. And whatever side you're on, that's the side you're on. But understand consequences come with your vote and consequences come with, your, with the side you pick. So here we are, we are uh, banning abortions, whether you, it's your thing or not. But we also have the other bill that's being pushed, the Unborn Child Support Act. So if you think that you are, a, that you are not going to be a part of this decision in some kind of way, you will be. You will be. So I wanted to just let you all know that these, these, uh, this election will impact everybody. Trust me, it's going to impact everybody. I only want to say what has been said a few minutes ago. The mortality rate, the mortality rate, black females. The mortality rate, black females. The mortality rate, black females. It's crucial, very crucial. You don't believe me? Call your mama today. I think even in Mecklenburg County, it's at 66%, um, the black mortality rate, and, and that's, that's horrific, right? And it doesn't matter education, it doesn't matter professional status. Um, we, and anyone that looks like us, um, sometimes get mistreated. Um, in that particular space. So thank y'all for, for talking about that. Um, my last question before I give it to Professor Davis to go into the audience, I want to talk about, Kevin, you made a good point about knowing the issues. And I think sometimes we get caught, we'll have two, two more questions, but we get caught up on who is on the ballot, right? And we forget that, particularly for the top office, which is President of the United States, they can make a decision of Supreme Court, which we have seen. And under President Trump, we saw the um, um, reversal of Roe v. Wade, of course, which we've just kind of talked about, but also affirmative action. And then we've seen an increase on the other side of HBCU entry, right? So can you help them understand how knowing the issues that could come later are just so important? Um, so, a lot of times um, on our social media feeds, we it kind of devolves into a personality, like a personality contest or a popularity contest. And being honest, if we were voting off personality, I know exactly who I go to. If we were talking about entertainment and who's the most entertaining, I I think we all know who's a, who's entertaining. Um, so, but it, it's it's important not to worry about the names and worry about the backgrounds and more so worry about the policy um, because it, it, I can't stress it enough, it will affect your everyday life. Um, I think if, um, if a lot of people knew what would have came with the 2016 election, I think we would have done a little bit, done a little bit differently. Um, but it's important. It's, it's it's important to to know the issue because it's not about the person. The issue the issues are going to the policies are going to um, be carried out. Doesn't matter if it's by you know this person or that person. They're gonna be there. So you have to make sure that you know about the issues and which way you want to vote. You might not necessarily. Let's just go bring it back to abortion. You might not support. Um, abortion per se, but there might be another issue in that um, candidates, you know, in there might be another issue around that topic that you might be opposed of. You might have been, um, you might know somebody who's going through IVF, and though you might not agree with abortion, like you agree with IVF. So it's important to know 
the the talk like the policy it's important to know the policy because the people the people don't really matter as much as the laws that are being put in place the personalities don't matter as much as the laws that are being put in place so don't vote based on people don't vote based on this name and that name or you know uh affiliation political affiliation fraternity or sorority affiliate vote based on who speaks to your topic who speaks to your issues and who speaks to your community's issues don't just think about yourself do not just think about yourself think about everybody else we are a community we pride ourselves as a community we refer to ourselves as the black community be a brother be a sister vote for your brother vote for your sister thank you thank you Ms. Drayton I want to ask you if you could tell us maybe three things that our audience may not know about project 25 because that's a 900 page document that's a lot. <laughs> it is. So uh, number one is uh, DEI. It's going to attack DEI. It's going to dismantle DEI. It's going to stop giving funding to organizations who have diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. That's uh, one thing. EOC, that is another issue that, they're, uh, that they are going to. And then overall, just dismantle the government. So, the, so now let me also say this. Project 2025 technically does not belong to a candidate. Mm -hmm. Project 2025 was created by the Heritage Foundation, which is a nonpartisan organization. You know, that's what that's what they're saying. So it's, it was not for somebody. But if they if that goes into play, this country will be run like more like a monarch, more like a we have one person in power who is going to take away all of these different um, offices that we have in the government. And so we have again, Project 2025 is incredibly dangerous to our community. It's, it's incredibly dangerous to everybody. But that's why as soon as they started talking about it, they immediately, you know, once it got out, because Project 2025 had been out for a while. It was not new. People just didn't know about it. And I, the first time I heard people talking about it was when Taraji Henson said something on BET about it. And then everybody started talking about it. And I was like, well, this has been out for a minute. So now they're like, oh, well, let's change the name to something else. People think that you are not watching. They do not take you to be intelligent. They think if they change the name, you don't even really know that it is the same thing. But you call it whatever you want, it is the same thing. So again, we have to be very mindful of what, we, what is happening, what is going on, and what we are not paying attention to. Ms. Blakeney, I want to ask you about North Carolina because I don't know if people know we've made national news with our governor election is coming up. Um, we are on the news, y'all. It is, I've never seen it like this, I don't think. Can you help, especially our students who are not from here, who, who come from Brooklyn, who come from Ohio, who come from Connecticut, Florida. <laughs> what is going on with this election? I'm from South Carolina. And now I'm from North Carolina. We have an interesting race, truly an interesting race. And I need you. This is one time I really would like the students of Johnson C. Smith to go back and didn't, didn't we give you, you all have uh, laptops? You have laptops? Y'all don't have laptops? Yes, you have laptops. Yes, you do have laptops. You know, I can tell you some things. Uh, we have two persons running for governor. We have Mr. Robinson, hallelujah. And then we have Mr. Stein, hallelujah. Two different people. Two different people. I ask you to take that laptop that you have and check out Mark Robinson as governor, and then check out Josh Stein as governor. I may come back over here, and if y'all see me, <laughs> tell me what you've learned. Please. Thank you, Ms. Blakeney. Uh, I'm still going to call you Professor Comfort. <laughs> um, Ms. Comfort wanted to offer some context, because I think she heard someone ask a question about maybe yes. what is going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, uh, the, the race for governor 
uh, in North Carolina has gotten very uh, slanderous, scandalous, uh, where the candidates are, are now taking very, it, it's not about the issues at this point in North well, Carolina. The race for uh, governor has gotten very uh, scandalous and that personal attacks are being made. Um, and to the point, again, trying to stay bipartisan, um, there is an African-American candidate and a, and a white candidate. Um, and oftentimes we, as a people, and I mean, if we're going to call a thing a thing, we have had a tendency to vote uh, based on race. And, and I under, and they say it's, uh, it's not by accident. Um, my grandmother used to say, you're so used to not having something that you'll take anything you can get. Um, and this is an instance where we cannot allow identity politics um, to take precedence. And we can't afford to just, oh, this is the black face. Correct. Because um, some black face is just that black face. Um, but this is an instance where we can't allow identity politics to uh, take over, where you really need to do your research on the candidates and where they stand on the issues. Um, and that's where the comments like all skin folk aren't kin folk come into play. So strongly encourage you all. Um, the governor has a lot of power right. is in where you reside, even if you're not from North Carolina. I'm not from North Carolina. I came to North Carolina to attend college. Like I'm sure any, uh, any student who's not from North Carolina, you came here for school. Um, but this is where you will be living uh, for the next four years minimum. And over 50% of students na nationally stay in the state where they attended college. So this will more than likely for over half of you become your home. So it's important to make informed decisions about uh, who gets power over, like the, that's gonna directly impact you. So I encourage you all to look into those candidates and their policies and not vote on identity politics. And I wanna say for those of you who don't know what's going on, please, please research. Um, but Governor Cooper was on the short list with Harris, and he removed himself because of the state of North Carolina. We are national news. So I really encourage you to do a Google search, and then you'll be like, ooh, <laughs> I see why they didn't say, you know, just some of the things that were happening. My last question, then I'll give it to Professor Davis. Kevin, if you could help, because I think for some, what I've heard, when President Biden dropped out, I think some people were like, can you do that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Can that happen? And then I think some people were like, this whole thing is a sham. That's what I've heard a lot. Right. This, none of this matters. It's a joke. It's, it's, it's now a circus. And this is why I don't vote Ms. Corbett. And this is why I don't vote Professor Corbett, because okay. this whole thing is a mess. OK. So historically, um, Historically, usually when a president um, is in office, they usually run for re-election. Um, I think this is kind of unprecedented where a president has dropped out of uh, a race um, for a re-election. Um, when I so when I when I heard the news, I was overseas. Um, I was in Senegal. Um, very. It was a very weird summer for me politically. I was very um, removed from, like, I was very, like, removed physically from what was going on and also mentally. Um, I remember hearing, uh, just to give some context, hearing about Trump's uh, assassination attempt while I was coming back from a party at the African Renaissance Monument in a taxi at 4 a.m. in the morning. So that kind of just goes to show kind of where I was at. So I had a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, I was upset that he did drop out. I was upset because he should have dropped out sooner. He waited a very long time, um, a very, very long time to drop out. Um, and I, I, I do think it was for the best, um, me personally. Um, as Kevin and not as a member of Alpha Phi Alpha or, uh, you know, an intern of anywhere. So I personally think it was, um, I personally agree with his decision to drop out because me personally and a lot of other people our age, um, we 
feel a certain type of way about last race. We feel a certain type of way about the race that was slated to happen. Um, and in some ways, the presidential election has become a circus from last election to the beginning of the, it, it was a circus. It's very slanderous. It's very um, hurling insults um, from some sides more than the other. Um, but I think that it, again, happened at a good time, not the best time, but a good time. And I think that um, now that we have um, new candidates in the race, I think that it is time to, again, do more research look into you know why it matters look into how um their policy differs from look into how specifically how kamala's policy um differs from joe biden's um she is actually historically um less conservative than he is he is a democrat but he is still fairly conservative so a lot of people assume that um and i try to say this as nonpartisanly as possible a lot of people assume that she's just going to do what he's doing um, when, in fact, they disagree on a lot of issues and she tries to push the envelope further than he will. So just go and look and research and research. And I know that as college students, we're busy. God knows I'm busy. Um, but it is important to look into why all of this matters um, and contextualize it. Just don't listen to TikTokers don't listen to influencers, don't listen to um, rappers who decided that they are now political leaders. Um, listen, <laughs> listen to, listen, look at research, just research. Look at um, nonpartisan, um, non-biased um, sources, look into the policy, look into the candidates, look into the historical context of what took place this summer. Um, not only with the dropping out, but even with the assassination attempts and kind of put everything into context. It, it needs context. It, at first glance, when I was in Africa, I looked and I was like, yeah, this is a circus. This is a um, show. Uh, this is a certain type of show. So I looked and, <laughs> but without context, it looks crazy. And it does look crazy. So, put add some context, do some research, take a little bit of a little bit of time out of your day, maybe 15 minutes. Um, don't get on your phone and go on TikTok in the morning. Go ahead, just go to Congress.gov, um, just for 15 minutes, um, and and give yourself some context because without it, it looks crazy. And I don't blame your students for coming to you <laughs> and saying anything because from where I was at in the world, it looked it looked insane. Hi, I'm Soleil, right? And I got a question for y'all. As like people who like voted before and stuff like that, I never voted before, right? And me personally, like politics, all of that stuff overwhelmed me. Like it's very like overstimulating and stuff like that. So like what advice would you give to people? Like I would like to vote, but like I can't like all that stuff is just a lot to like process and like to actually like choose and think about. So like what advice would you have for me? Um, I'll, I'll start because um, as just like you, I've never voted before. Um, this will be my first year being eligible to vote. Um, and politics, I don't like politics. I don't, I, I am informed. I don't like being informed. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot on my mental health. I don't like knowing about everything going on in the world, but um, it is a civic responsibility. Um, I say start with what matters to you. Start with what, you know, what issues matter to you, what you want to see in the country. Um, start small. You don't have to go and you don't have to subscribe to, you know, CNN or subscribe to Fox or be on the news all day because God knows I hate watching the news. Um, I tell my grandma to watch the news less because she's scared of everything. Um, <laughs> but go ahead and look at the inch look at the look at the issues that affect you personally look at what affects your community and make an informed uh, decision based off that if you look at it in small pieces if you look at if you look at at it personally and on a community level on you know your friends level on your family's level it'll be a thousand times less um, 
overwhelming and scary because if you're looking at terms that you don't know, which I still do, a lot of stuff I don't know. I'm not, not very, a lot of stuff I don't know. So look at what you do know and make your decision based off that. One, I appreciate your, your honesty and that and transparency because I, I know it's probably some other people sitting there that feel the same way. Um, but you've already taken the first step attending things like this that where politics are being discussed. Um, and then a, a quick and easy next step is like to go to uh, specifically for the presidential election. Go to both candidates' uh, websites and look at what their platforms are. Like what are they pushing in their platform? Um, and then also if you go to, they've given it a couple times, congress.gov, you can look at some of the things that are on the ballot or will be on the ballot, some of the bills and policies um, that are coming up or that, that are important. Um, and then a, a second easy next step, if you haven't, you can watch the uh, presidential and even vice presidential debates. They're, they're very entertaining. Um, on uh, like a YouTube even, to just get an idea, because they'll ask questions about issues um, and you'll be able to hear where each candidate stands on issues and even some of the things that you see on like TikTok and social media actually come up in the debates or have come up well oh you said this before and then walked it back four years later which changed and you'll be able to see their responses so those are like two quick next steps like look at both candidates sites so you can see what their platform is um, and then watch the debate like the, they've only had one um, which is also unique this election cycle. So you can see where they, how they respond when questions are asked about issues. Hi, my name is Michaela. Um, my question I have is how are them asking for IDs is voter suppression? I asked that because like when they said that in the um, constitution that you have a right to vote, but also that you have to be a U.S. citizen to vote, I feel like asking for ID is also a way to prove that you're a citizen in the U.S or other reasons too, but I don't see how that is suppression for them asking for IDs. If, if you can talk about, because I don't know if many people know, but there is a constitutional amendment on the ballot in North Carolina that strips the um, naturalized citizenship language from being eligible to vote. So if somebody can include that in their answer. Um, there are a couple ways in which uh, asking for identification is voter suppression. Uh, for a lot of identification types. For example, you have to have uh, an address. So what if I was born in the United States and I am a citizen, I have a social security number, um, but I don't have a home address. I can be a houseless uh, citizen. And that contributes to voter suppression, right? Like I don't have the, the resources to get identification um, or even an address to list from my identification. And there, there have been steps taken now, I've seen on a lot of the registration forms, like what's the closest uh, in proximity, uh, but that's a form of voter suppression, right? Um, if I'm a, a houseless resident, there to that point of taking naturalized uh, citizens off of like eligibility. So if I went through the process to become, I may not have been born here, but I've done everything to become a citizen and then still won't have the right uh, to vote as a form of voter suppression. Um, and then identification. So if you look at the forms that you all were given, if your license is expired or has been expired, or your identification has been expired, uh, for a year or more, or like, let's say I have a passport, my passport is expired, I don't have the money to renew it, that's voter suppression. We're now criminalizing poor people, we're, we're, we're criminalizing poverty. And I just wanna just add really quickly, seven, the last time I checked, 75,000 black people in uh, North Carolina do not have uh, any type of identification. There are people who really don't have identification, and so the Board of Elections will uh, give you a free ID, but the Board of Election closes at 5 p.m. If you don't have a car, you now have to pay to try to get all the way to the Board of Elections, but then you work a job that if you take off the job, you don't get paid. So now you've got to try to take time off, get on the bus, pay to get on the bus, get to the Board of Elections by 5 to get your free ID. Voting shouldn't be that difficult. It is about, I think it's point and 
point zero, let me just say it this way. It is a myth that there is this huge mass, I'm going to the, you know, going to go vote and I'm going to pretend like I'm somebody else. It's, it's a, a number like point zero 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 four percent of a chance that that even happens or that does happen. It doesn't happen. So they've created this issue that doesn't even, it's not even really an issue. So that's what happens. So voter suppression and asking for ID, it is very real. And then the, the bill that they're talking about, when I, it took me a few times to read the bill, because I'm like, why is this even an issue? Because non-citizens can never vote. But what they did is they took that naturalized citizen, they're playing with the words. And so that's why you've got to really pay attention. Uh, may I just answer this one? Um, just to answer your question, I talk to 50 year olds who have the same issue that you have, like it's so much going on, I'm just not gonna vote. I'd like for everybody to um, download the app called ActiVote. And I'm fine if you pull out your phone right now and do it. ActiVote is A-C-T-I-V-O-T-E dot com. Go ahead and download ActiVote because what it does is it shows you what's, and it's very easy to understand. It shows you what's going on, it'll show, and it gives the pictures of everybody who is on your ballot who when you go vote, it shows everything. So activevote.com is fantastic. It'll walk you through the laws, it was on the ballot, it's great. If you are homeless, you still have the right to vote. But I don't have a home. I don't have an ID. But I still have the right to vote. That's voter suppression. Okay, my name is Kali. My question is, how do you all feel about third party voting? Because a lot of people think it's not worth it to vote because the person they vote might lose. Um, uh, um, so I, I wouldn't say that, a lot of people say that a, a vote for the third party is a vote for um, the other side. Um, I'm not going to say that per se. I think that you should vote for whoever um, you align with. Um, but you also have to kind of take into perspective the historical context that a third party candidate hasn't won the election. Um, and not going to say that they likely won't ever because change, we just talked about change. But in this election, it is highly unlikely that a third party candidate will win. So. I'd say try to vote, try to vote. Uh, I don't like saying this because I don't like the two party system, but try to vote within the two party system um, because it is highly unlikely that um, the candidate that you vote for a third party will win the election. And um, yeah, so. I, I'm in agreement with him. I really don't think in this election, in this election, a third party candidate would win. Uh, I say to you, but if that's your right, and that's your choice, exercise, exercise your right to vote. But I truly, that's, that's Deborah speaking, I truly don't feel that a third party will win the election this year. That can happen. Like I said, change is inevitable. A third party could win. But we haven't heard a whole lot from the third party. So that's why I'm saying to you at this time, I, think, I don't think a third party candidate in this election would win. I agree. There's, there's a little too much at stake in this particular election. Um, the president will be choosing Supreme Court justices. And I don't know if y'all are aware, but Supreme Court justices serve a lifetime term. Um, and that is part of what contributed to the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Supreme Court justices were selected by the president. So this is, uh, you can make your, make your own decision, um, but also think about what's at stake and the probability. Is it possible? Sure. But is it probable, which means likely to happen, that a third party would win this election? No. Um, so in having a background in community organizing, what would be most uh, feasible is if you 
vote within the two-party system this election and decide, hey, I'm actually tired of the system and, uh, and actively organize the next four years to put a third-party candidate at the forefront. And us as a people have to stop waiting until election year to start caring and getting involved. Um, we There's a possibility that in future elections, we you know, if the people want enough uh, change enough, organize around a third party candidate. Um, but again, there's just too much at stake, at stake this election um, to risk the, the run the risk of a, a third party candidate when the probability is not high. I just want to add really quickly that the number, the margin is so is so close, especially in North Carolina. So I want you to think about this. In North Carolina, it was 1.5 million black registered voters. 1.5 million. 500,000 decided not to vote. Former President Trump won the state by 73,000 votes. 500,000 black people said, I'm not going to vote. Former President Trump won by 73,000 votes. We have elections that run so close here in, in this, in our state, that take, you have the right to vote who, for whoever you want, but understand it's a numbers game. So if we're already running so close, and then you say, well, I'm going to give my vote to, now I'm going to vote for the person I believe in, um, that is going to take away because the margin is so slim. So I love the question, and I love your response. Use these next four years to really start to mobilize, but this just probably isn't the year for that. Just probably is not the year. There's a question back there. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly ignorant to it, um, but I think you made the point um, a few minutes ago, something about like vice presidential candidates. So outside of like, you know, race and misogyny, why do you think people outside of, yeah, like I said, outside of race and misogyny, why do you think people are going so hard about a vice president not doing anything? Because like prior to this, I've never heard of, you know, Biden or, um, whoever was Bush's vice president at the time and so forth and so forth, they've never said anything about them doing anything, but now that it's Kamala, it's a big problem. So now that this is a part of a conversation now, do you think after this election, like vice presidents or vice presidential candidates will have to, will have more responsibility? And I'm not saying that they don't have responsibility now, but I personally just don't know exactly what their role is. I do know like if something horrific happens to the president, you know, they take over and so forth and so forth. But, you know, like what do you think is going to happen and why do you think like this is a conversation outside of just, you know, her being, you know, black Indian and her being a woman. That's that's why this is coming up in the way it has. We have we never asked what did Biden do when he was vice president? <laughs> people, and, so, and then there's two parts of that. So we have race and misogyny, but we also have people don't understand how politics work. I've had people say, well, I'm not voting for the president because the potholes on my street haven't been fixed. Well, they don't even do potholes. So it's, not, it's a gross lack of understanding of what people, what the roles are. And so I think that you have, that is one of the biggest issues that I have seen. People just don't, they just don't know. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And I hope you all learned something. I hope more of you are going to vote between October the 17th, yes, and November the 5th. Thank you so much.